All right, welcome to this week's bite sized topic is using Canvas groups to support SBI. Um, so move forward. Let's just get through these slides because today I'm the only one here, which is awesome. So I'm going to skip through this. Um, as always with all of our professional development, we always tailor it or tie it to the MTSS framework. And with this topic today, specifically scaffolded instruction and grouping, we are talking about how Canvas can be used to support the SBI groups. Um, the learning intentions and success criteria for this PD are, I'm learning how to create and use Canvas groups to support SBI. I know I'm successful when I can create, edit, and access groups created in Canvas and provide learning opportunities to those groups for SBI time. Now, as I go through this, I just wanna be very clear that what I'm sharing today is just ideas. I think when it comes to Canvas, it's it's good to know what options and features are available within the system itself. And then you as the teacher can decide what's gonna be the best way, what's gonna support you as you're working with your students. So as I'm sharing ideas or throwing things out there, don't leave this thinking you have to do it all. Um, sometimes just knowing what's available is helpful um, or knowing what you don't know, but just I just want to start giving ideas and you can take anything that I'm sharing and adapt it to what's going to be best in your classroom. Or you also have the opportunity to work with your school based instructional coach or even reach out to me if you want more, maybe more one on one support or even to like bounce ideas back and forth. So here's the agenda for today's session. I'm going to talk about the difference between SBI practice stations and centers, and then share a slide that I got from some other specialists in the instructional supports department that shares what makes an effective practice station. I want to share what supports are available for math and ELA. I'm all about what is out there for me to, to use and not have to come up with on my own. I'm going to share some Canvas examples, and then I am going to go into Canvas and show you what I mean, like what the groups are, like how you can create groups, how you can do group assignments, and then how do students access these groups when they're in Canvas. So the first slide, SBI versus practice stations versus centers, and I'll be completely transparent with you. When I was looking more and more into this, because over the summer, I was pulling some examples for K2 specifically of how could Canvas be used for um, practice stations? And I was even confused, is it SBI, is it practice station, is it centers? And as I dug a little deeper and I even consulted with my colleagues, um, there are distinct differences between the two. So I wanna start with centers. I'm starting on the, the far side. Um, centers, usually the same activity for all, rarely any differentiation. They tend to be more exploration activities. These activities can vary from simple to complex, concrete to abstract, um, but ultimately they're activities for students to participate in and interact with. Now, you might hear that and say, well, you can do that in practice stations as well. And you're right, so, so there is some like overlap, some correlation, but the difference between centers and practice stations are practice stations are meant to be structured and they're very intentional. Um, they can be done independently or students can do them with partners. Um, they can reinforce the scope and sequence of previously taught skills. So normally with practice stations, you're not um, introducing new topics. Um, I mean, I would never say never, right? If there's a, you might have a reason where you might do that, but usually it's reinforcing things that have already been taught. It's extending for deeper thinking and understanding. It's where you can make those science and social studies connections. Um, and like SBI, this is where there can be some correlation between practice station and SBI, these groups are meant to be a little bit fluid. Um, they don't always have to be the same groups every time. The tasks can vary day to day, but very conducive to flex flexible groupings. So with skill-based instruction, the main difference with skill-based instruction is you're targeting specific student skills at their level. You're using data. You're teaching essential skills like reading skills, closed reading, and this might be where more of the explicit instruction is happening. Um, instruction is differentiated based on assessment results, so that data piece. Um, it's targeted using intervention tools, and usually this SBI is done with a classroom teacher or an interventionist. Um, groups like practice stations are they're meant to be fluid. Students should be going from one group to another. And once again, that's based on the data that you're collecting and analyzing. Um, students apply the learned skills. There's opportunities for practice and feedback, that direct feedback from like that classroom teacher interventionist and provides explicit and systematic instruction. So 
one of the questions that that when I was talking to someone about this that comes up with skill-based instruction, a, a common question among teachers is, when I'm working with these skill-based instruction groups, what are the other students? What are they doing? And that's where the practice station can come into play, where one state, one of your practice stations could be you're meeting with the teacher. That's the SBI time. So I'm hoping that helps you. It helped me because initially I was like, aren't they all the same thing? Similar, but there are distinct differences between the three. So this slide I got from Leanne Fisher is one of the PDs that our ELA team has done over the years, but it's what makes an effective practice station. So effective student tasks are inspiring learning in the classroom to be relevant to current learning, practices, skills, um, work is authentic, engaging. It can be independent, but it can also be maybe a partner and definitely aligned to the core. Um, the ineffective student tasks, rarely authentic. If it's redos of and you don't ever want to just have them redo work that's previously done if it's too easy or too hard, if it's something they're unfamiliar or not modeled. Because you want to think about as you're having students work in the practice stations, you want them to be able to work independently. But if it is unfamiliar or they're not sure what to do, they're going to interrupt you as you're working with your specific, like your skill based instruction group. Um, so I wanted to really make sure I pointed out these, the supports that are available, and these are in our curriculum maps, and I think all K through five curriculum maps. So the first image you're going to see on the far left is the skill-based grouping in ELA. This is in the curriculum map. It talks about considerations for educators, suggestions for practice stations, and it even provides a link to the skill-based small group instruction manual, manual. And I'll be honest, it's been a while. I'm, I'm, I have, it's been a while since I dove, dove deeper into the specific section. I didn't even know the skill-based instruction manual existed. And as I clicked on it, it provides very specific activities, um, ideas. So you're not alone. So you're not having to figure this out on your own. It actually provides, like a you'll see on the screen, a group one lesson plan and talks about the focus of instruction, um, like how many days it can take up to, and then content instructional plan and even materials. So it's awesome to know that this is there for you. It's for your support. And if you're not sure where to find the manual, it's manuals.canyonsdistrict.org. And you can click on your specific grade level to find um, what's apl applicable to your grade level. And then on this screen, I have people who can support you with this. So if you're like, after this bite-sized PD, you're thinking, okay, I, I want to I want to learn more. I want to do more. I need I need help. Your school-based instructional coach is someone you can reach out to, or um, if they're not able to help you, Leanne Fisher and Susan Henry are two contacts in the instructional supports department who would love to meet with you, correspond with you, talk with you um, to help provide more clarification when it comes to supports for ELA, specifically with those skill-based instruction groupings, or even practice stations. They'll help you with that too. Um, the same type of supports are available for math. So on the screen, you're seeing a skill-based instruction in math. This page is in the curriculum maps, and it's actually in the math section. So same type of things you're seeing as considerations for educators, um, suggestions for math centers. And then there is this math skill-based small group implementation plan. So once again, it really provides some ideas, um, specific ideas that be doing. And when I was talking to Leanne Fisher about this, she said the same type of implementation plan is available in the ELA section of the maps as well. And then on the screen, I have who can support you with this. Once again, your school-based instructional coach. They really are a great contact if you haven't tapped into that yet. But then also Sally Ann Wakely and Ashley Lennox are two of our math specialists who can help you specifically with math. And then examples with Canvas. Now, if you if you attended our district day at the beginning of the year, um, and I don't think I shared it at Digital Teaching and Learning Summit, but I know <laughs> district day, and there's a bite-sized PD where I talk more about this as well, ideas of using Canvas. But one of the ideas I shared was um, skill-based instruction or was like practice stations and how Canvas can support you with that. So what you're seeing on the screen, um, the ELA centers you're seeing on the left-hand side, now that I know more about centers and practice stations, I would probably change it from centers to practice stations at least. <laughs> but um, one on the left hand side is a content page that students can access. And you'll see where I have it separated by groups. So, like red group, blue group, yellow group, green group. And then the one, two, three, four is their rotation. So, anytime that they see me, the teacher, 
that's going to be the skill-based instruction time where they're going to come meet with me for that skill-based instruction. And then the other rotations would actually be the practice stations where maybe it's the word sort, it's a writing activity, or maybe I'm having them read something or it's linking out to like Lexia or something like that. Uh, the other section or the other um, example is organized it's content organized in a module. And this was an example I actually pulled from a first grade teacher last year who was teaching at Lone Peak Elementary. And you can see where she had her ELA centers and math centers. And once again, now that I know more about centers, I'd probably change that to maybe practice station instead of center. But um, she's using the, the information she got from the curriculum maps and she has her dictation center, a stamping center. And what's happening in each of those pages, when cl students click on those pages, that's where they're getting specific information from the teacher. Um, actually, a screencast. I'm going to show you a short video in a second. But um, the video is actually giving students the, the um, oh, let me see if I can play it from here. But the teacher's giving the students um, their, oh, you can't hear it. I'm sorry. But if you notice, it's a first grade classroom. Um, students are accessing the content in canvas but they don't have to submit it in canvas they're just getting the directions from the teacher completing their work somewhere else on a piece of paper maybe they're sorting something but canvas is being used as that delivery tool just to support so the teacher can be working and focusing on the students that they're meeting with one-on-one -on -one or in that small group so when it comes to using canvas um, people who can support you once again your school-based instructional coach or even me camille cole um I'm the Canvas admin and lead for our district, and I'm more than happy to support you. And also, I don't have his name listed, but Jonathan Stewart is another contact on my team that can support you with using Canvas as a way to support you with this. So maybe this might be the reason why you're even watching this. You're like, great, Camille, you talked about all of that stuff, but I'm ready to know more about what do you, what, what are these Canvas groups? Um, so in a minute, I'm going to get out of the the presentation, I'll actually go into Canvas and kind of click around and show you some things. But the Canvas groups, it's a feature within Canvas that allows you to create what they call multiple group sets. So it's almost like types of groups that you can have. And it helps you organize um, students within your course into smaller groups. Um, and that can help you do group assignments. Uh, it provides a collaboration and workspace. And you can even use this feature to identify like a group leader. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first learned about Canvas groups years ago, um, one of the first things I used it for when I felt the most, most comfortable or I wanted to start playing with it is I just used it to help create my groups. And that was it. And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. And that can be as simple as what it is. Like maybe you want to just use it as a way to help you quickly sort kids or help you those kids from one practice group or SBI group to another. Um, and it can also be a way to communicate those groups to your students um, and make it more visible of what groups that they're in. And so if that's where you start, that's awesome. Um, you don't have to, everything I'm sharing today, you don't have to implement, but like I said, it's just good to know about it so you can then make the decision of what's going to work best for you. So the what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to actually create a group set and how to add students to groups and move them around. So I will show you how to create the groups. Um, I will show you how to make a group assignment. And one thing I'll stress over and over again is just because I, I am creating things in Canvas or even calling it an assignment in Canvas, it doesn't mean they actually have to submit it in Canvas. Um, you definitely can have them submit. I've done that, but it doesn't have to be done in Canvas if you're using Canvas. Um, I'll talk to you about the student view, and then I'll talk about the workspace as well. And then I'll access what the groups look like. So I have, there's another bite-sized PD that talks about Canvas for a Canvas for elementary view. And when I get to that part, it'll make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to get out of this presentation for just a moment, and I'm going to go to my Canvas course. And I'm just going to check my screen off to the side to make sure it's still there. All right, so if you want to create a Canvas or do the Canvas groups, you have to be in your Canvas course, so the course that has your students, and you have to go to the People section. So in the People section, this is where there's an, ev an Everyone tab, and if you haven't created a group yet, you won't see another tab like I do, but you will see a button that says Group Set. So I'm going to click on, you know, plus Group Set. So this is like the type of group. So maybe this one's called... I'll say my math practice stations. 
And on this screen, there is a way for you to allow self sign up. This tends to be something for older students, students that you would trust. Like if you had topics, like, hey, you get to choose what you want to learn more about or what group you want to be in. That's where you can allow a self sign up option. Um, I've used that with more adult learners than I have with like the younger students, but fourth and fifth grade, you might be able to do that. No problem. Um, the group structure, you could actually say split students into, if you want four, five, six, two, because they split into this many groups. Um, you can even say split into groups with how many students. So maybe you're not sure how many groups you you that's going to create, but you're like, I know I want students in groups of three. So you could say split the groups, the students into groups of three, and it'll automatically do it for you. Um, create group members to be in the same section. Um, this is for my more for my middle school and high school teachers. DLI, this might apply to you if you've cross-listed courses. And if you just heard that and you're like, I don't know what that means, cross-listing probably doesn't apply to you. But like my DLI teachers, you may have cross-listed. So you could require that the members are in the same section, meaning it's that same. Like if with my DLI, it's like you're if you're one, if you're two different groups. You want to make sure that they're in those, they're in groups with those students, not mixed. But maybe you do mix the kids between groups. Um, or you can just say, you know what, I'll create the groups later. Just create my group set, I'll go create them later. And then you could automatically assign students at group, as group leaders, um, or once you create the groups, you can identify that. So I'm just gonna do this, split the groups, in, or split students into four groups. I'm gonna hit save. Um, so you'll see, because I only had like two students in my class, it created four groups, named them all practice station one, and it, for the two students I had, put them into my groups. Now, there's these little dots off to the side, and I can move the students from group to group. So even though it may um, auto-create the groups for me, I can make any adjustments I feel are necessary. And if you ever have any unassigned students, they'll appear in the unassigned section, and you can just move them to where you want to go. So with this, you can then, on the three dots off to this other side, you can edit. And that's where I can actually change the name. So you'll see on my, I had, um, let me hit cancel. So my SBI groups, I actually used an emoji and did like red group, blue group, yellow group, green group. And how I did this is I just go to Emojipedia. This is the same if I ever add emojis to um, like my modules. I just search for like red square. Oops. Oh boy. I do red square. Um, go here. I copy it. And when I go back to my groups, and I'll go to my practice station. I can edit and I can just paste it. Oops. And I can keep the name as math practice um, one, or I could say red group, or what, however you have them, you have them named. And I can hit save. Um, so that's how I can edit it. The other options I can delete, I'll talk about the group homepage in just a moment. Um, that's coming, but I wanted to at least talk to you about how to create the groups. Because then once my groups are created, um, you do have an option, so that's creating the groups. I wanna to talk to you about the group assignment, because that could be an option. Um, with assignments, if I create a brand new assignment and actually, I had one that I was playing with before. So let's say here's the assignment that I want for the red group to work on, but I don't want every group to have access to it. That's where creating an assignment um, and only assigning it to that group can be beneficial because then only those group, that group assigned to it can have access to it. And one thing with this, you'll see that I have them submitting nothing. So it is okay to create an assignment and not have points tied to it and don't have um, the students submit anything in Canvas but you can always have them submit in Canvas if you choose to. So I'm gonna edit this assignment and creating the assignment is just like you create any other assignment. Like you give it a title, you add the content. And with practice stations, I think anytime that you can provide a screencast of you sharing the directions, it's super beneficial and helpful because you can't, and this is for my adult learners as well, never assume that anyone's just gonna read the text and understand that. There is something about having 
your teacher looking at you, sharing the information. So if you can include a screencast, um, I think that's, and don't let that intimidate you. I, I mean, here I am even recording this right now. And if I make mistakes, it's going to happen, but I'm going to keep going forward. And that's okay. You just, I talk to the camera, like people are sitting right in front of me. And that's kind of the, the take you should take when you're making screencasts for this. So include your instructions. The point you can add points if you want, but if you're like, I, I don't care about the points in here. Just put it zero. Um, the assignment group, I specifically made it an assignment group called SBI group, so I could keep those together in my Canvas assignment section. And then you can even display the grade if you want to as complete or incomplete. Even though I selected this, I may not actually go in and mark anything. I'm just using it for delivering the instruction. And then the submission type is where you can say, no submission, you can change it on paper, online. But I'm just gonna say no, no submission because they're not submitting anything online. So here you'll see where I there's a box that you can check that says this is a group assignment. And when you check that, you have the option to assign grades to each student individually. That's helpful if you are gonna have students submit something. If you're having students submit something in Canvas, you can have them submit like one document, and then you apply the grade to everyone automatically. Unless maybe they're working together, but they're still responsible for their own product, whatever it might be. If you check that, you then have to um, grade them individually. The group set, this is where I can say it's my SBI groups. And then if you, have, if you want to create a new category, you can. You're essentially creating a new group set rather than going to the people section. But I like doing it before. And when it says assign to, when you're assigning to, um, it defaults to everybody. But you'll notice because I indicated this is a group assignment and I said it's the group set for SBI groups, I can now say I don't want this assigned to everyone, meaning I don't want everyone to see it. I just want the red group to have access to that. And then if you want it to show up on the student's to-do list, which appears on the home screen of the Canvas course for them, you can give it a due date or you can leave the due date totally blank. And then you can save and publish or save. Just know when you want students to see it, um, they, it needs to be published in order for them to see it. So now I can see it's assigned to the red group. And um, like I said, if I give it a due date, it'll appear on their to-do list. I can add this to a module. I can link it on um, a page. Um, I now have the options to do some things with this page. Now, an, a message that I clicked through real quick that I recognize I should probably say something about. Um, let me hit save. It's this button right here. It says, not all sections will be assigned this item. That just means over here under the assigned to, I said not to everybody, just to the red group. So Canvas is now telling me not every kid's going to have access to that. So just something to know. Um, and something you can even do if you know, I want my red group and my blue group to have access to this, you can actually assign it to multiple groups and then save. And you will still get that message because I'm not assigning it to all of my sections. So that is the group assignment. And I want to make sure. Okay, so on this screen, you'll see um, the student view. So on the student view, I actually wonder, I should have been more prepared with this. I'm going to click on the student view here. And if you didn't know about the student view in your Canvas course, it's a good way for you to see what do the students see. Um, normally when it comes, so this particular test student is not assigned to any groups, um, but I'm going to go back to my presentation. So notice how there's the to-do list. Course groups will appear right underneath that. So on my home page um, where it says to do, any groups that the, assign, the students assigned to will appear where it says like, pretty much under the to-do list. So it should be there for them. Um, and actually, I'm wondering if I should click in, let me go to Safari real quick. It might be easier just to see an actual student I have in this class. I apologize for the wait. Um, let me show you what it really looks like for Johnny. So if I go into 
Oh man, this might be a bad example. Let's see. I may have, um, oh, it's not the exact group I was working in, but notice how I'm in is Johnny. And here is a course group that I'm in and it's the awesome group. And when I click on that is Johnny, it actually will take me to a homepage, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Um, because right now I haven't added anything there as a teacher. Hi, I'm recording. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Um, so I'll talk about this in just a second, but this is where you can add as a teacher more information. So let me get to that in just a second. Let me share the other spot. Oh, groups. So Johnny, on the this is the global navigation bar. It is the dark blue bar. Um, there's a button that says groups. Students will see that and they can click on it and they can actually see all of the groups that John, that they're in. So you can actually see that Johnny is in three different groups. It's not telling me what courses these are in, but it's telling me these are three different groups. And I can tell you right now, they are in different courses. So it could be problematic if all of my groups are named red group, but um, when Johnny clicks on it, it takes him to that collaboration and workspace for groups. So let me talk about those collaboration um, groups. So as the teacher, let me leave this student view. When I go to the people section, remember where we went to go create our groups. Um, when I clicked on the three little dots off to the side, that's where I could edit the name, but it also has a visit group homepage. And I'm gonna be honest, this is something um, I just learned about. Like I just, I didn't really know it existed until probably the past few months. Um, cause like I said, when I was using groups, I always did just using it to help me create my groups. And then, um, even the group assignments I dabbled with a little bit, but I haven't explored this much. And so this is where I wanted to at least let you know it's here and available. And as the teacher, you can decide what's going to be the best for you. So with this, you actually have the opportunity to make an announcement. Um, you can add pages. So when students click on pages, you could have pages created that are specific for um, your students. Um, so this could be where, when, I mean, when Johnny's going to go to his red group, as the teacher, you're saying, okay, go to the pages section of your group workspace. That's going to have your tasks for you. Or click on the announcements, and then you can the students can click on the announcement, and then this could actually have maybe some links to what they need to do. Or if you're not linking, maybe you're just providing the tasks for um, that topic. And you could even, because um, I know one teacher I talked to, is who I saw her do this and I'm like, wait a second, I've not played with this enough. Um, when she was doing groups, she actually has like a to-do list or a task list for them to do and she updates that every week. Um, there is a way to have discussions. So you could actually provide discussions for students to go back and forth. And with this, I would always recommend having like, set the expectations like PBIS is very much in play here. You want to make sure students are using the discussions appropriately, that they're accessing the announcements and pages accurately. Um, you'll see where as the teacher, I can actually switch groups very quickly. Um, the add announcement buttons over here. Um, you actually have an edit, gr edit group, but um, basically all I can do is edit the group name. But um, collaborations, this will probably be more for your older students. Like my fourth, fifth grade, possibly third grade, depending on the group. Um, but you actually could have them create a Google Doc and they could actually be collaborating together. But once again, I would have clear expectations, protocols, guidelines, just to make sure PBIS, like you don't want kids goofing off or being inappropriate um, or just inappropriate essentially and just goofing off. So, but let me show you Johnny. So once again, when I with Johnny, I went into my group. You can see here's the workspace I have as a student. Now, students do have the option to make announcements. Um, yep, so they have options to make announcements. So you might want to tell them you don't make announcements. Um, or if you want them to be able to post an announcement, you can. Once again, I'd have my expectations, my protocols in place. There's pages. And notice there is a plus page, so students could actually create a page. So maybe you are having them collaborate on something together. They're creating a page. They're adding um, content. Uh, you can decide what you want them to do or have pages there ready for them to access. Um, they are able to see who's in their group. 
So when they click on people, they see group members and who the teacher is. There are that discussion. Now there is the option to, st to start a discussion. So I just make sure that as a teacher, you're monitoring this just to make sure it's appropriate. And then files, they can upload files if there's any images, documents they want to have access to or share. So really this becomes a workspace for the group. And you might be watching this going, this is way too much for me, Camilla, I would never use this. And that's fine. Once again, I want to make sure you know what's available and you can decide as the teacher um, if you want to use it or not or how, how, it, how it works for you, yes or no. Um, ignore the big blue conferences. It's not something that we use here in Canyons. We use Google Meet or Zoom um, for video conferences. So I just feedback I've received over the years, and it might be better now than it has been in the past. It was just always a glitchy program. I wouldn't even go there at all. And then the collaborations is where you can do the, the Google Docs. So I thought this was interesting. Um, it's interesting, though, because when you go to home, notice there's no home page. Um, the announcement that I made doesn't automatically show. I wish it would have given that feedback back to Canvas, but it is a way to create that collaborative workspace for groups if that fits your needs or your learning intentions, the, um, like what the scope of what you're really trying to do with the Canvas groups. Um, and I think, yep, so the Canvas workspace. So for anyone out there using the Canvas for Elementary view, the groups just looks a little bit different. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the Canvas for Elementary view or how to gain access to that, um, there will be another opportunity to opt into that version of Canvas, like the view of Canvas, sometime in January, and information will be sent out. But there are some um, past bite-sized PDs, I think back in August, that you can go review to know what the Canvas for Elementary view is all about. But the course looks something like this. So notice how the setup's a little bit different than most Canvas courses. And there's a way to add groups to your navigation. So as a student, I would go, go to my Canvas course and I could go to groups. And the student here would see what group, like see the groups that they that are in the class, and they can click on the group they're in and basically be taken to that collaborative workspace. And as the teacher, I can go to groups and I can manage groups from here. And this is where I can create those group sets and everything I could do in the previous view of Canvas. So it's very this is very much the same. It's just the setup's a little bit different. That's the thing about the Canvas for elementary view. I always say it moves the cheese just enough where it looks a little different, but it's still a lot of the same processes. So it's just a different way to look for groups. You can hide this or you can actually make it visible if you use groups. And then it's just that much more accessible um, in the face of students of the groupings. So I hope this was helpful. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. As a reminder, I did have some of those um, contacts throughout the slideshow if there's something more specific you're wanting feedback or, or help on. Um, Canyons U, this video will be posted on our Canyons U site. Don't forget to fill out the form for relicensure credit. This is also linked on the Canyons U site. We award the credit um, about once a month on Midas. So you get a 0.5 credit for every bite-sized PD you attend. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you have a great day.